This meeting is being recorded. Uh, welcome to the New York Giants Preservation Society meeting for today, April 14, 2023. We have the wonderful Paul Dixon here. Paul is a noted historian, uh, fantastic writer. And besides that, Paul is a great guy, and I'm going to explain in a second. Paul addressed the New York Giants Preservation Society last night uh, with about 30 people in here, and they were asking wonderful questions. And then all of a sudden, my computer went blank. And Paul was gracious enough to uh, come back today uh, without any complaints. And I, I'm so grateful. And the group is grateful, Paul, because um, I want this to be uh, recorded because uh, a book that you wrote has just came out uh, come out in paperback again, and it's a fabulous book. I'm going to show the audience. Leo DeRocha, uh, Baseball's Prodigal Son by Paul Dixon. So, Paul, welcome. And before you give your spiel, why don't you tell us the title, what that's inferring to? Because last night, I, 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 the group learned so much about uh, Mr. DeRocha, and uh, I think that would be a great way to start. And then you can talk about whatever you want. We'll pop in some questions. And we'll go from there. Well, you know, the, on these kind of biographies, you're you're always you. It's easy enough to come with the person's name. That's the title. But the way to come, you know, you got to come with a subtitle that gets you in almost immediately into the in the game. So the biography I wrote just before Leo DeRocher, um, uh, Baseball's Prodigal Son. We'll get that. That was the subtitle. Before that, I did a book on Bill Beck, and it, it was called Bill Beck: Great, Baseball's Greatest Maverick. So I tried to, I tried, it's almost like high, writing haiku. You're right, you're trying to encapsulate a person. And, and I would struggle with DeRocher. You know, I was going to call him baseball's bad boy, baseball's this. And then I realized what happened with, with DeRocher was no matter what he did, and he was on a, a number of major league teams, four major league teams as a player. He was a manager of four major league teams. Um, uh, he, was, uh, the, he was the prodigal son because he would screw up, he would alienate people, he would get in trouble, he would be banned from baseball. But he was always sort of allowed back in. And the part of it was, he was very clever, he was a very good manager, he was a very good player, he was um, all of these things. And so in, in any other walk of life, um, if he was a lawyer, he would have been disbarred <laughs> two years after he started, and that was the last you'd hear of him. But baseball, as in the Bible, the prodigal son, of course, no matter how much he sins and, and disappoints his family and, and the Lord and everybody else, he is, um, he is let back in or, or, or God. And, and he's, so he's, so he's accepted back and forgiven and then not, not totally forgiven, but you know, he's, he, they're allowing him, they let him back in the fold. <laughs> and that's what baseball did with DeRoche. So I think it was the perfect, and, I, and it's, I think it's a kindness to him because I could have gone with something more, now the book, the book was originally hard covered, now soft cover. Yeah, the best way to get the paperback is how. You can get it uh, on online. Amazon and Barnes and Noble both have it online. There's also Independence online, and many local bookstores that specialize in baseball books will have it as well. Perfect. And it's, and it's from the University of Nebraska Press, which is very interesting because Nebraska is now becoming the one of the biggest baseball publishers in the country. It's a university press, but they've got a group of guys there uh, who just love baseball, love baseball history. So that's why it's a, it's a new outlet. As the New York publishers get less and less interested in books that aren't big, big blockbusters, they're you know they're this is a great place to go with it. So I'm very happy with those guys at that's Nebraska. Cool. Why don't you tell us, uh, much like last night, uh, how you got started in baseball, and then the Rocha as a uh, player, and maybe mm -hmm. uh, then as a manager. Yeah, I, I mean, let me start, Gary. I, you know, the reason I, 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 as I pointed out before, but I'll do it again. Part of what intrigued me, I, I, I was born into a family where baseball was a big deal. Baseball was a big deal. My great grandfather, a guy named Philip Lairbach, was a guy from Brooklyn who came over from Germany. Um, and he became involved in horse racing and bowling and different things. And he became, um, he became a partner of Charlie Ebbets of Ebbets Field fan fame. And what those guys did, the way they made a lot of their money and, and survived and prospered in America was to become the sort of the Johnny Appleseeds of, of, of 
bowling. And they went all through New England, all down through the Mid-Atlantic, starting bowling leagues, starting bowling alleys, bringing portable lanes and challenging the people there. And they made a lot, a lot of their money came from the fact that the two great groups for bowling were Germans and Italians. So they, part of their deal with these local bowling alleys was they would import German beer and Italian wine for the bowlers, keep them keep them uh, lubricated. So uh, you know, I had that. And when I was a little tiny kid, he was, my, he was in his 90s, but my great grandfather, I would go down and get the New York Sun and bring him the paper. And it had, you know, they would stamp during the afternoon, they'd stamp the scores on the front of the New York Sun with a uh, rubber stamp. So you'd get all the scores and everything. And so I'd get him the paper, bring him to him every night, I'd bring him the paper about seven o'clock every night. And his, he, had, he was in a room in a, in a sort of a rooming house. And um, his wall had Jimmy Fox, he had Lou Gehrig, all these people on the on the wall that he admired and had met through the through through Charlie Ebbets and through his being a, a, a great man in Brooklyn. They just call him a boulevardier. He was sort of a he never really had a job. He was always involved with horse racing or or bowling, which was a great matinee sport in New York. Um, one of the reasons they built National um, with Madison Square Garden was for the two great, two of the great sports of the time, which were bowling and uh, tug of war. There were massive tug of wars in them. And so, so this, all this was my, you know, my family, all this stuff. And my, 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 my uncle came home from the war in 1940, uh, early 45 or, or summer 45. You know, he took me to Yankee stadium. I was only five years old and, you know, he, I got to meet Tommy Hendricks, who was also in, in a uniform. So, you know, my first ball game at five years and, and I'm treated like a king because I come in with an uncle. And he's got a he's got a, a, a blouse, you know, typical Navy blouse with a with a fruit salad of, of, of campaign medals. And and he's little kid, pulling this little kid along with him. And so um, so it's just been in my family. Everybody in my family just sort of loved baseball. And my you know, my father was I told this story last night. I'll tell it again. My father was would never take me to the polo grounds. And this is uh, because when he was young and trying to, very poor kid, and he was really working to keep his, he actually at one point to support his parents, he'd try every sort of way to make money. And one of the things he would do is he'd make these scorecards, which were fans, like, you know, which you fan yourself. So on one side was a scorecard, which you could write on. The other side was ads of the fan, were ads from the funeral parlors and bars and saloons and such. And so, uh, but the but he was doing giving these away at those polo grounds and the Stevens Company, which ran all the concessions back in the day, and maybe still do for all I know. So where, um, they they got him arrested. They, they got him detained. They told had him to remove him and stuff. And so I said I was they embarrassed me at the polo grounds, so we're not going back. But so so I, so I, and the other thing, I grew up as a kid in the midst of all this stuff. You know, I can tell you exactly where I was when Tom, Bobby Thompson hit his home run in 1951. I was playing pool. Uh, I was, you know, people, good people in Yonkers. Kids in Yonkers after school either played baseball or played pool. Um, but it was, but, you know, I, and I, so I, I loved the thing. I loved the, I loved having the Yankees, Dodgers, and, and, and the, um, the Giants all on the radio and all these great Southern voices. You know, these were not these were not guys with Brooklyn accents. They, these these were these drawling, wonderful, metaphoric, you know, can of corn kind of guys. And uh, Mel Allen, I, I could say it, it, was, it was, but but they, they and you know, Red Barber, etc. And so, um, and I saw so I, I always wanted to write about this period, but so much has been written about Mantle and DiMaggio, and you know, all Willie Mays, everybody. And I, I, after doing book VEC, I thought, you know, maybe some of the most interesting characters were not necessarily, you know, the Bay Ruths and the Yogi Berras and the Carl Ferrellos, et cetera, but, but, but it was actually the guys, the managers and the owners and the and people who, who, who sort of had a major impact on the game itself. And so I picked DeRocher and I got, um, it was really a fascinating uh, experience because here's a guy that starts playing he starts the first game he plays in as a New York Yankee. He was on the Murderers Rose Yankees. He comes in, um, he debuts with the Yankees October 2nd, 1925. And he plays, plays his last game as a player. Last game as a player, April 18th, 1945, as a Brooklyn Dodger. 
So you look at that span, and that doesn't count as years in the minors or anything else. You look at the span of years there, and you realize that takes you from the great prosperity of the 20s through Prohibition, through the Depressions, and through almost to the end of World War II. He's playing. And um, he's playing. Um, I mean, he plays for this, comes up with the Yankees. Uh, he's one of the first numbers out there when they, you know, Ruth is number three, all the numbers for the, the famous team. They first, he was one of the numbers. And, and uh, he was with the Yankees as part of that. He was an amazing, amazing fielder. And he, and, he, and he played for the Yankees, then the Cincinnati Reds, then the St. Louis Cardinals, the Gas House Gang. Uh, he was on that team, the Gas House Gang. And then the Dodgers, where he played, uh, it was the last area where, team in which he played as a player. Um, and then sort of became a player manager in the, at the end there and then became became the manager, but he was, his batting average was nothing to write home about. It was two, 231, I wrote it down here, but I think that's right, 231, something like that. But it was, it was not, a, it was not a batting average, but, but he played on three all-star games, teams, and he was, he was by all accounts, and this is a number of writers going back through the, you know, the New York papers and the St. Louis papers and, you know, the, all the writers at the time, he was probably the best defensive shortstop of the period between the wars, between World War I and, and World War II, or through World War II. He was something else. And he was, um, he was fast, he was duplicitous, he could trick, trick um, runners into thinking that he was bobbling a ball and not bobble the ball, he did everything he could. But in the midst of all of this, he had a, an ability to sort of alienate those around him, whether or not they be Dan Hopping of the Yankees or the other Yankee players, the Yankee players. Some of them, it was at a certain point when the games really didn't count, uh, they would actually cause him to make errors. He, he got out of their skin so much. He was such a braggart. He was such a, you know, he wore spats. I mean, he comes in as a rookie, he wears spats and a cane. I mean, he dresses like, you know, George M. Cohen and give, you know, he, he, and then five, after he's played in five games, he gets some of these people, a bookie and other people, uh, and some bootleggers, uh, guys who are in uh, speakeasies to sponsor a Leo DeRocher day at the, at the, at the Yankee stadium. Now here's Gehrig and Ruth, all these other people on the, all the great Yankees on the field. None of them have ever had a day. The first day Gabe Ruth gets is when he's when he's dying of cancer. He gets to this. They have a they have a they have this day uh, for Leo DeRocher, and he gets all these people to put up money for it. And they, of course, he's not even in the game. But he brings down busloads from Springfield, Massachusetts, to see this Leo DeRocher day. And they all come down in buses, and they load. His parents have a big thing. Well, not only is he not playing, and it's his day, and in, the, in, in between the games, it's a doubleheader. Between the games, somehow they somebody got together this purse to give him a thousand dollars to honor him on Leo DeRocher Day, and the, you know they respond. I, I actually found in the Library of Congress the brochure that was sent out for Leo DeRocher. So all these people have never had their day. They've never had a day, a special day. Here he is out there, and the fans from Springfield, and they're playing the Red Sox. So the fans from Springfield, they come all the way down. They're furious that they haven't, they're not playing DeRocher that day, which is partly the management just getting back at them. They don't put them in the game. They get furious. And of course they start rooting for the Red Sox. <laughs> so here's the special section right in Yankee Stadium, all these Red Sox, you know, free them to you. But he, it was like he could, he could turn in, you could give him a, an amazing blessing, which he gets this blessing of being drafted by the Yankees right out of the Hartford team. And, and, and they put him, the, but, but he, but he just, he, he ends up blowing it, the ego, the everything else that he does. He gets, runs up huge debts with, there are all these places in New York, these Taylors and Dunhills and all these fancy places in, in New York. He just runs up huge debts. And of course they came to the team to say, please, you know, pay us back. But, but again, it was, it was interesting just following him through these years. And following on the on the on the on the Cardinals, you know, the, some of the greatest teams of that whole period, um, and he co goes through this period. Um, he's brought up. It's just an interesting little thing. He's the guy who pushes him. He grows up in Springfield. 
he even as a child he 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 well, he imagines this childhood in his autobiography, Nice Guys Finish Last, that never existed. He tells a story about, as a kid, he, uh, this was in his uh, autobiography. He says, as a kid, they used to, on a boring day or a tough day, they'd, they'd skate from Springfield, Massachusetts, up to Boston, get to the Harvard boat yard on the Charles River on skates, ice skates, and then skate back to Springfield. Well, you read this and you say to yourself, wait a second, the Connecticut River runs north to south. It goes down from Massachusetts through Connecticut. It doesn't go towards Massachusetts. The Connecticut, and, and he, 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 so it doesn't go from west where Springfield is, east to Boston. He, and the other thing in his, I won't go through all the stuff in his biography, but another thing in his biography, he claims as a kid that he that he took a window pole. And if you anywhere near my age, you remember. The window poles were these big oak sticks with a brass, you know, thing on the end of the hook. Yep. And he and a math teacher got mad at him and slapped him. The math teacher turned around. And he apparently back, uh, hits the math teacher in the back with this window pole, and he's expelled from school and he loses a scholarship to Holy Cross, where they wanted to play basketball and baseball. Well, I said to myself, "There's got to be some record of this other than him." I mean, if your kid did that, I went through the. I went back to Springfield. I talked to all the people there, went through the records. And they said, no, if, if a kid had hit a, a teacher in the back with a window pole, the police would have arrested him. He was a teenager. I mean, he was in high school. You know, and he, he would, there would have been a record of this. And it would have been in the papers. And so, but, so, so all the, but he, he told stories that made him sound like a, a hoodlum. Like a, a, so, so this the enigma to me of De Rocher is as he gets bigger and bigger as a, a factor in American life. I mean, everybody knew the name De Rocher. I mean, it was always because he was on he was on the Jack Benny show. He was on you know all the shows had him on. He was on What's My Line. He was on Mister you know Mister Ed. He was in the Monsters even in the television age. So it's this it's great enigma to me of this guy who who has everything at certain times. He had, you know he brings Jackie Robinson up, he uh, he paves the way for Robinson. He gets himself into the, the Brooklyn Dodgers the same week that Robinson comes up with the Dodgers. He gets expelled from baseball for gambling and for having in the Brooklyn dugout having bookies and gamblers in the clubhouse the whole deal and sleeping with a married woman and all, all the rest of it. So, um, so I, I, I guess, you know, big, being the fact that we're talking about the giants here, I'll jump to the giants. Cause that's, that may be the greatest point in his life. There's a point at which he's with the Dodgers. He's done admirably in bringing Jackie Robinson. That may be his greatest accomplishment. He gets Jackie Robinson up, um, and then is immediately expelled from the game. So he doesn't get to manage him. The next year, DeRocher comes back and immediately starts picking on Robinson. Claims he's fat and lazy. Uh, claims this and immediately alienates himself from Robinson. Eventually, he is driven. He drives himself off the, uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers and goes across the river or across Manhattan. The, the geography eludes me for the moment, but goes from Brooklyn to the Bronx. Or New York City, actually Harlem, but he goes to uh, to the Giants, and um, it's it, it. And I was a kid then, but that it was the biggest headline you've ever seen because we had the Mirror, the Daily News, we had you know every Mirror, the Sun, the Telegram, you know the Times, the Trib, and um, it was it was this amazing moment. It was like Grant in the middle of the Civil War going and changing places with Lee. You know, going to the Confederacy. Uh, it was because the because the because the rivalry between the two uh, was so intense between the two, and and uh, it was it was it could be brutal at times. I mean, it would, there were fights broke out, etc. And um, when he goes to the Giants, he somehow turn he, he changes, and it's it's temporary, but he changed. He gets there. And he's got he's got um, these players that are not going to take. He's traditionally been um, very um, difficult with rookies, especially. He really knew how to didn't know how to treat um, rookies well. He berated them. He got mad at them. He gets to the Giants, and the first 
season he's there, he gets um, Monty Irvin and, and, and Thompson, not Bobby Thompson, but the, Hank, Thompson. Well, Hank Thompson. And I, something he comes to realize something. These guys have both been in the war. They're both veterans. Monty Irvin, who suffers no fools, and I did a lot of interviews with Irvin for this book before he passed, Irvin, Irvin, Irvin had been on the third day of the D-Day invasion. Um, Bear, Yogi Berra was in on the second. Very few people realized that those two guys were, were in the actual D-Day invasion. And something in DeRosha realized these were not a bunch of kids out of some small town in the South who could be bullied and, and treated like, you know, for lack of a better term, dirt. He realized these were men. And if he started making messing around with them, it was, he's going to blow up the team. And he was also integrating the team. And he also he also knew that he was he was in a very precarious position. So he's got he's got these black players that are playing for him, and he's got to make sure that works with the fans, that works with the rest of the league because it's still controversial. It's still not everybody. The the Red Sox, the Yankees, still haven't integrated. There's a whole big thing about integration. And he starts treating them like like men, like he like he trusts them, like he'll go to bat for them. And Irvin, Irvin, for the rest of his life, the rest of his life uh, is is the one who, who protects Leo. He 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 had one. He's the one who Leo probably never would have made it in the Hall of Fame. There was huge resistance. Irvin was the guy who broke. He actually ran interference for that. The end of some months after those guys, and he starts with the Giants, uh, the first full season with the Giants, along comes Willie Mays. And this is when he's total, he is totally changed by the time Mays comes up. He realizes Mays is scared. He, he's way in above his head. He's not sure where he is in, in, in this, you know, the sphere of the world and everything. He hasn't had the military to sort of toughen him up. He's come right out of, out of the, you know, the Negro Leagues. And in the South, and he treats him like 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 a father would treat his son. He treats him is exactly the role he plays, and he says to him right off the bat, you, "Mays, come when he comes up, as you well know, Mays went into an almost immediate slump." And 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 LaRosha goes to him and says, "Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it." He says, "You what you you got to do is just be Willie Mays. Just be who you are, and you'll come around. You'll you'll, you'll find your." you know, you find yourself. And of course he, within a matter of hours or days, he's found himself and he's, he's delighting the fans and he's, and he's the great on his way to becoming one of the greatest stars. And the, 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 the again, the proof of the pudding with, with Willie Mays is that he, when DeRocher dies, when he finally dies, um, the only ball player uh, who comes to his funeral to speak to, get, to, to deliver a eulogy is Willie Mays. Yet on the same token, some of the so so here you know here he is almost the ideal man. Yet yet so he can take other teams when he's in the Cubs, and as any New Yorker or, or fan knows, of course, uh, the '69 Cubs lost to the Mets in the in sort of a, a, a dramatic end of the season. Uh, but he, one of the reasons he he um, he, I, I, I believe, and I think many people believe he, he lost that. He, he had totally demoralized his team. The, uh, just with the just exact opposite of what he did with the Giants. Years later, he does with the Cubs. He does everything wrong. He, when the p- p- pitchers came to him and say, you're leaving me in too long, my, my arm's killing me. He'd punish them by leaving them in longer. He would berate the two players that he berates, that he tries to drive out of the game, our, our um, Ron Santos, who everybody loved, and he always picking on Ron Santos, and Mr. Baseball himself. Ernie Banks. Uh, yeah, Ernie Banks. Ernie Banks goes home to his mother. Goes home to his mother. He gives this interview, and he said, I go, and he said, DeRosha was picking on him to such an extent. He said to his mother, he said, what have I done wrong? Why does this man hate me so much? All I'm doing is trying to do the best I can for the team. And he hates me. And he says to his mother, he says, mother, mother, why, what have I done wrong? I mean, it's almost, and he, 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 and he, and even Santos, Santos, Santos decides one day that he wants to have 
Santa's really uh, very ill with diabetes, type one diabetes. And, and Santos gets this idea and he works it through the owners of the team that he's there's going to be a, a Grand Santos night in which he reveals to the fans and to the press that he has diabetes, that he's living with diabetes, that diabetes is something you can live with. And he uses it as a night to raise money for diabetes. Well, DeRocher can't stand this, even though the Santos' reasoning is pure charity and pure you know, whatever you want to call it, pure good fellowship and, and, and thoughtfulness, DeRocher can't stand it. And I think some of the, I think what, one of the things that happens to DeRocher is when anybody has a bigger share of the limelight, with the exception of Mays and, and, and Irvin and a couple others, but, but on certain areas, I mean, he, he hated Ruth. He punched Ruth. He had stole Ruth's watch, or it's strongly believed he stole Ruth's watch. Ruth went to his grave hating him because he'd stolen his watch or Ruth claimed so. He, he um, no matter where he went, he'd pick out um, the most, the big, biggest name. It would be Ty Cobb. He made up all these stories about how he knocked Ty Cobb in mean, one game early on. He'd thrown a hip at Ty Cobb and knocked him on the ground. And there's no record to indicate how Cobb was knocked on the ground, but he always picked the biggest target he could find. So in Robinson, he got him. He feuds with Robinson for years. They don't even talk. And and, and you know. He, and so I think he just couldn't. I think in Chicago, Santos and Banks were about as high up on the ladder of likability of two any two players you could imagine. They're almost you know archangels or something. And he re, he they they the guys he just picks on. So again, he's he's fascinating because he's a very good manager when he wants to be. And he's a very good player when he wants to be. Let me just ask you a couple of questions. We'll wrap it up. Yeah. Um, so was last night we were talking and, you know, in the Hall of Fame. And he, the, uh, the plaque uh, has him in a Dodger hat. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about that? I mean, it's not that it's a big deal, but did you, do you feel he, he, he's in there for his time on the Dodgers or the Giants or? I, I guess... I mean, if, if, if you're a cat, I, uh, the only reason I could justify the Dodgers hat is if he was in there because he was a player for the Dodgers for so many years and he was manager for the Dodgers for so many years because he was manager of the Dodgers all through the war or through most of the war. And so he, so that would be a way, way to sort of identify him as two ways. Um, Another thing Cream is, is a giant. I'm sorry. Um, you know, I, I, it's it's hard to say. They're, 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 he's not the only player that has that that, or the only figure that has that. Uh, uh, he probably petitioned to get it changed, but <laughs> uh, other than other than sixty nine, uh, I, I assume he was considered a, an excellent tactician. We spoke about sixty two World Series. Could you uh, yeah. comment on that? Yeah, I mean the 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 sixty two world Series, just just he just used his. Uh, I'm sorry, the playoffs, the sixty two play when the Giants and the Dodgers, and there was question about Walter Alston uh, making oh, yeah. bad moves. Uh, my apologies. Yeah, yeah. No, I think he. What happened in that period was he basically uh, worked his way. You mean after the season? Yes. He worked his way off the off the uh, t of the team because I think he was backbiting with Alston and. Uh, I, I just think he just didn't didn't fit anymore. And he's and he comes back, he comes back again. That's when he comes back after that. He comes back with the with the um the, of course he ends up with the Astros, and that's a bad fit. Um he hates the he has to, hates the Astrodome. Larry Durka, who was one of the his top players, who he again he, he picked out Larry Durka to sort of be his his uh fall guy, you know, he's always picking on Durka. And Dirk was one of these guys. I actually interviewed Dirk, talked to him a couple of times, and he's just one of these guys that likes to give me pick on. And he's not. He's not a. He's like the anti-bully. He's a big guy that he's. You know, why are you picking on me? You know, I'm just Larry Durko. And he said that DeRocher had every characteristic that you would want in a baseball man, except for character. Two uh, two other things. So uh, the seminal. Uh, I think uh, events in his career, you, you spoke last night about 51 and 69, correct? 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 51, they were both miracle events. One was the miracle at Coogan's Block, or whatever the name you want to use for it, uh, the shot heard around the world. But it was the word miracle was about the comeback with the with the Giants. And the other was the Miracle Mets, who beat him. Uh, uh, and I think he led, he gave, he didn't give them. The Mets were really fought for that. And they, including, you know, releasing a black cat and a few other things to get, you know, playing almost a Rocher's game, but he, I, he did, he, re, he just destroyed that team uh, in terms of morale, in terms of whatever. And then he also had these bleacher bums it, and he sort of encouraged them and they'd be, they were really hoodlums. They were really bad. They were throwing flashlight batteries at the players. And so Paul, where do you, uh, Les, where do you rank him as far as, you know, we always talk about baseball characters Top ten character of all time. I mean, I no, I you know, I think, I think he's the greatest enigma. Enigma, okay. Uh, of baseball, I think he was. He had everything, every talent you can imagine. I mean, and he was a conversation. He was funny. He could get, you know, when he first arrives in in Brooklyn, he says, and somebody asked about his name. He says it's Derosher, rhymes with kosher. I mean, can you imagine a better line to go into Brooklyn with? And, and so, and he was funny. And, and one of the guys, there was one of the advertising guys who worked with him, made this comment. He said he could walk into a room filled with atomic scientists, a, a pot cocktail party filled with atomic scientists, and he would have picked up one fact about nuclear what, b- b- more stuff in the men's room, and he could, he could charm the whole room with that one fact. He could basically go into a room and take over the room. The dynamic and, and the women, I mean, he, three of his four wives were extraordinarily beautiful. Well, one of them I just don't know enough about, but I mean, th- th- there are three of them that were, they were all more powerful than he was, including Lorraine Day, the great movie actress. Uh, and he, um, and the, the, the other Grace Dozier was an an entre- brilliant entrepreneurial woman who dress designer who had her own factories manufacturing dresses. She was a major manufacturer. She was third wife was quite wealthy, uh, or fourth wife. All these phenomenal women. I mean, and, uh, I'm not sure saying this isn't sexist talk. It's like they were powerful. They were smart. Right. They were they were all had had probably more you know, almost, you know, sort of women of the year characteristics, they all leave him. And it's not because he's abusive or because he beats them or because he you know, verbally abuses them. He just loses interest in them. He just loses interest in them. He says, sort of, well, I'll, and he starts you know, fooling around with other women. But, but it's, but it's, it's this anemic one. He, he gets these wonderful marriages and he blows them because he's, He's Leander Rocher. You know, he can't resist blowing me. I'm the and the funniest. You asked me last night about my funniest anecdote, and and I thought about it after we, we went over it. But I think the funniest, the most interesting anecdote in the whole writing of the book was, you know, he dies, and it's four years after that that he's in the Hall of Fame. And as I said before, Monty Urban was instrumental in in pushing him in, and and a couple other people, and there were a group that was really opposed to him. Um, but when he gets in, they, they have the they have the ceremony in Cooperstown, and Lorraine Day, his uh, third wife, who's older now, and her son, her son, his Leo's stepson, Chris, uh, present him at Cooperstown or to accept the plaque, accept the honor. And Chris comes up, and he's very moved. Chris DeRocher, very moved by. The ceremony and his mother Lorraine Day has to sort of lead him away, and then she gets up and she said, "You know, everybody has him as this mean guy and all this stuff." And he said, "Don't you people realize it was all an act?" <laughs> and apparently everybody's stunned. She's saying, "No, no, no, he really was a nice guy. He just put on this bad guy, bad boy thing. It was all an act." And it was like the last, you know, the last act of, of a show of Dallas, the old show where you, you wake up, it's a dream and say, what? All the, I mean, his whole life was an act. <laughs> like it was all a put on. It was like, and, and I still think that's the funniest thing ever because the very end she says, 
no, thank you, folks. It's not. It's an act. You know, that's all, folks. You know, Paul, I cannot thank you enough. And this is why it was so important that you came back today, even though you didn't have uh, the audience we had last night with the questions. Just fabulous. Again, here's the the book out again on paperback. Paul says the best way is through Amazon and your local bookstore. Paul Dixon, thank you so much. Please don't be a stranger. And for everybody out there, a great book to have. One of the most uh, uh, characters in the game who uh, is a mysterious man, as, uh, as Paul has stated. So, Paul, again, thank you so much. Have a great thank night. You. And thanks thank again. Bye-bye. Bye. You, Bye. Okay. Bye.